when a jhanli analyzes the factors of the first jhana, he divides them into two sorts, causes and effects. The causes are directed thought, evaluation, singleness of preoccupation. The effects are pleasure and rapture. It's making the point that you do the causes and the results will come. You don't do pleasure, you don't do rapture. You direct your thoughts to the breath, you evaluate it. Try to stay focused on the breath as much as you can without any disturbance, which allows you to make some careful evaluation to decide what kind of breath is going to be good for you to settle down with. What do you need right now? You have to use your powers of judgment. This is why they try and say to make a survey of your body and your mind as you start out. Are you feeling tired? Are you feeling on edge? Do you need a relaxing breath? Do you need an energizing breath? Get a sense of what you need and then how you can provide it. That's the evaluation. Chan Li also makes the comment that when you've got those three factors that are causes, you've got both concentration and discernment. The directed thought and singleness of preoccupation or the concentration. The evaluation is the discernment. This evaluation is a matter of passing judgments, and that's what discernment is. The discernment leads to awakening is when you realize that things you've been holding on to are not worth it. But the practice of using your powers of judgment doesn't start with the concentration. It starts very early on in the path. When you judge who you're going to take as your admirable friend, who's worth associating with, who's, who's not worth associating with. Years back I was asked by a scholar of Mahayana Buddhism where in the Buddhist teachings in the Pali Canon did he talk about not passing judgment on people, because that's a very big Mahayana concept. And I found only one spot where he says when someone has passed away, don't pass judgment on what you think their attainment might have been. You should never know at those last moments what someone might be able to do. But beyond that, the Buddha recommends that you exercise your powers of judgment and you start with judging who you want to hang around with and who's not a good person to hang around with. The Mangala Sutta starts with asewana japala nan bandi dana jasewana. Associating with wise people, not associating with fools. And you have to pass your judgment as who's a wise person, who's a fool. Now it's good not to think that you're passing judgment on the total value of that person. But the question is, the question is who should you spend your time with? When you go to other people for advice, who whose advice do you get? You have to judge who's going to be a good person for you to be with and who's not. And this is not being arrogant. It's being wise in a very basic way. Then as the Buddha encourages you to develop your judgment further, there's that question that lies at the beginning of discernment. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? What, when I do it, lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? You're choosing what actions are worth doing. You're passing a value judgment taking your long-term happiness as your guide. You don't want to take your feelings of, I like doing this, I don't like doing that. If you let your likes get in the way, that's not wisdom. It's a judgment call, but it's a very poor one. The Buddha is teaching you to be judicious. You don't want to be judgmental, in other words, passing judgment without really looking at the facts. But you do want to be judicious, because as human beings we have only so much time. So you want to use your time well. Then you bring that ability to make judgment into your meditation with the evaluation and the concentration. And then as you work on the more purely discernment matters, what's worth hanging on to, what's not. We read all those 
instances in the canon where the Buddha gives his questionnaire about the five aggregates not being worth clinging to at all. Well, that's where people were on the verge of awakening. In the meantime, there's some aggregates you want to hang on to. After all, the, the, the intention to stay with the precepts, that's an aggregate, that's a sankara. The intention to practice concentration, that's an aggregate too. In fact, the states of concentration are composed of the different aggregates. You've got the form of the body, and breath, which is an aspect of that form, as you feel it from within. You've got the feelings of pleasure or displeasure, which you're trying to convert into feelings of pleasure throughout the body. You've got the reception of the breath as a whole body process. Those are the images you hold in mind. When the breath comes in, where does it come in? And what do you have to do? Which muscles in the body have to do the work to bring it in? Which ones don't have to do the work? And if the muscles that have been doing the work are getting tired, how do you let them relax for a while? And give yourself another picture of how the breath can come in the body that doesn't you need those muscles. There's the basic intention to stay with the breath. And then on top of that, there's the directed thought and evaluation as you talk to yourself about the breath. And then there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. So you've got the aggregates right here. You don't want to let them go until you've turned them into a really good state of concentration. So the value of judgment here is anything that's not related to the concentration, you want to let go. Anything that is related, you want to hold on to. So that you can master this as a skill. I don't know how many people tell me they've seen the concentration as a constant stressful not self. They actually tried concentration once and found that it was inconstant. Well, of course it's going to be inconstant when you try it just once. But the Buddha doesn't say abandon concentration. Concentration is part of the path. You try to develop it. And to develop, you have to really give it your, your full attention. Give it the time it requires. So hang on. So wisdom is a judgment call. Discernment requires a value judgment. That's for anything that gets in the way of the concentration. That's what you apply to the three perceptions to. The question arose was either today or yesterday about why is it that inconstancy is supposed to be such a a good perception for letting go. Well, you apply it to things that matter to you, things that don't matter, or things that don't directly affect you. Yeah, you could say the world changes, the weather changes. So if there's a change in the weather in Florida, a change in the weather in Europe, it doesn't matter. Unless you know somebody in Florida, know somebody in Europe, then it matters a lot. So the point here is that if you want to let go of something, if you want to apply these three perceptions in a way that does help you let go, you want to focus on things that really matter to you, things that you really hold on to, but are weighing you down. And you want to see that it's not worth holding on to. So you use that contemplation. It's not a matter of just saying, I'll do inconstancy for a couple of days, and then not self. As the Buddha said, there's a connection when something is inconstant and you've been hoping to pin your happiness on it. Then you realize it's stressful. When it's stressful, why well, hang on to it? Here again, the concentration, the practice of concentration does contain some stress. After all, you have to keep doing it. It's not the case that you set the mind on the breath and then can forget about it, and it'll stay. We had someone living at the monastery one time who was talking about his dream dog. When you tell the dog to stay, and then you come back a couple hours later and the dog is still there. 
That's not what the mind is like. You tell it to stay, and then you turn your back and it's gone off someplace else. So you have to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. But for the purpose of developing the concentration, you hold on. It's only when you've really mastered it and then use the concentration to act as a kind of fulcrum to pry away your attachments to other things. That's when you finally turn around on the concentration itself. Say so the fact that you have to maintain it finally wears the mind down. The mind is looking for something more solid, something that doesn't require constant care, doesn't require constant attention. That's when you start focusing on, is there something better? Because that's why we apply these perceptions after all. We know that the Buddha said there is something better when you can let go. That's why they work in the context of the vulnerable truths, and especially the context of the third. That the end of suffering is dispassion. It is letting go. And so you apply the perceptions to let go in the, with the confidence that you'll find something better. So again, a value judgment. It's a matter of passing judgment all the way through. It's simply a matter of learning to get wiser in how you pass judgment. So take this opportunity to get some practice as you're evaluating the breath. Remember, there's nobody else who's going to be able to tell you you're with a good breath right now. Or maybe you should change your breathing to make it longer or shorter, or deeper or heavier or lighter. You're the one who has to decide. And you have to live with the results of your decisions. This is how you develop your powers of judgment. You create your meal of concentration and then you taste it. And then you see how it goes through your system, whether it's good for you or whether it's not. And if it's not, then, then you go back the next time and try something else. To learn to exercise your powers of judgment in as wise a way as possible. We're not here just to accept everything. There are a lot of things in the world that are not worth accepting. And it's only when you exercise your powers of judgment that you'll know what's worth accepting, what's not, what's worth doing, what's not. And when something is worth letting go and when something is worth holding on to in the meantime. <laughs>